you. Glad you're all here, and uh, welcome. Glad you're with us for the first time. We'll try not to run you off. Uh, hey, I want to give a shout out to our fire team in Coco. Ron Goss is leading us. He's uh, a week behind, but he's got a team over there, and they are they're with us. They're in this series with us, and uh, so I want to say hi, hi to you guys, and thanks for following us. Hey, listen, at Forge, we really... <clears throat> we really are about building great men as God defines greatness. Uh, there's so many uh, divergent masculinities out there. There's a lot of confusion about what it means to be a man today. We're trying to cut through that. And our point here is that when a man is a fully devoted disciple of Jesus Christ, Jesus himself builds him into biblical manhood. And that's what we're about. And, uh, and, and, and so the core identity of a man and the core role of a man is crucial knowing that we're deeply beloved sons of the Most High God with the, the core roles of, of a leader, worker, provider, warrior. That's where our purpose lies. And uh, speaking of warrior, uh, Sunday was Veterans Day, and we're going to spread that out a little bit more. And if you are a veteran, would you please stand up so we can thank you for your service to us and our country. Veterans, thank you, thank you. Thank you. We have a lot of veterans here, and some of you, I, I, I'm not sure you stood up. David, did you stand up back there? All right, good. All right, you're still in, so there it is. But uh, we love you. We appreciate you. I was watching a little bit on Fox News. They had an interesting deal with uh, uh, several warriors, Marcus Luttrell of Lone Survivor, Rob O'Neill, 400 operations as a Navy SEAL, also as the guy who's known as putting a bullet in Osama bin Laden, Sean Parnell, U.S. Army Ranger. The long, his, his platoon had the longest deployment uh, ever, 458 days in Afghanistan, right on the border. They were in constant combat. And uh, Dakota Meyer, Medal of Honor winner. And uh, Luttrell, I like what he said. He said, you know, in America, there's an upper class, a middle class, lower class, and a warrior class. And I like that. I like that. And Pete Hexfeth, who interviewed him on Fox, said that he considered all those guys heroes, but he said what he, what he recognized about those guys is that none of them wanted to be called heroes, but they all embraced uh, the title of warrior. And I thought that was so good. I mean, who is and who is not actually a hero? I don't know if we'll ever know until we get home. But, but the reality is, is that we here at Forge talk about us embracing that label as being a warrior. And that's absolutely important. Part of, that's part of our purpose. I, I don't know about you, but I gear up every day, and as I get ready to go out, Ephesians uh, 6, 10 through 20 is what I talk to myself about. And uh, I identify as a warrior. I'll go over that verse later. Um, when I got to speak uh, outside of Fort Bragg a couple of years ago, uh, it was two years ago, I I said, I got to get your, their latest camo. So I bought a pack outside of Fort Bragg, uh, and, um, and some guy saw, some, later, some guy saw me with that backpack on. He says, uh, well, you don't carry a briefcase? I said, I'm not a businessman. I'm a warrior. And I said that before I was thinking. I go, um, that probably wasn't the most appropriate thing to say when I said it. <laughs> but I'm not in business. But, but, yeah, I was at church or something, you know, but... Um, but, but I'm, I'm not a businessman. I'm a warrior. That's part of my identity. And I hope you identify that way too. Uh, Paul did in Philippians 2, 25. He said, I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my needs. So one of the major metaphors that we see in the New Testament is manned as a warrior. And that's important. Now, how we self-identify is crucial. Why am I bringing that up? Because we're bringing up this question, and we're in this series, Your Call. These are questions that have come from you. Uh, and so for the rest of the year, uh, I'm answering your questions. But how you self-identify and how I self-identify as a Christian helps answer the question that we're going to look at today. How do I follow Jesus at work without being religious? That's the question of the day. Uh, here it is. Oh, wait. I went the wrong way. Here we go. There we go. No. Okay, we're there. Almost. <laughs> there it is. There it is. We'll get it straight. 
How do I follow Jesus at work without being religious? How you identify helps answer that question. So you've got an outline. Let's take a look at that, and you're going to have some fun time around the table today, either contradicting me uh, or uh, straightening me out. So here it is. Let's take a look. First, in answering this question, how do I follow Jesus at work without being religious, you gotta, you got to define the question, uh, what is, <sighs> there it is, what is religion? And so religion, first of all, as I looked it up in the dictionary, and it's important to do that sometimes, a religion is a belief in and reverence for a supernatural power recognized as the creator and governor of the world. So religion, in a very broad sense, is defined that way, right? You'd all agree with that. You can't uh, defend that. And then uh, a particular integrated system of this expression. So if we talk about the Hindu religion, uh, that's what people mean by religion. And there are the four great world religions, right? Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism. And we say great, we mean they're great in numbers, right? So that's what we're talking about with a number of offshoots. So let me ask you this. Is Christianity, by that definition, a religion? Yes, it is. It is. All right, let's talk about being religious. What does religious mean? I looked that up too. Uh, it's of pertaining to or teaching a religion, adhering to or manifesting religious attitudes, pious. So uh, a religious person is simply someone who wants to follow a religion. So would you agree with that, generally speaking? So a religion is believing in a God who created all things and governs the universe and if you're religious, you are trying to follow uh, the tenets of that religion. Now, there's, so there's a very real sense in which this question comes up, uh, I don't want to be religious. There's a very real sense in which we don't have to run away from that as, as, a, as a point because we are followers of a religion and we believe in a God. Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. I love this. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was, and God saw that it was good. Uh, and, and, and so God called the, day, the, the bright or the light day, and the darkness he called night, and it was evening. And morning, the first day, I was waiting to see if trip you up. Because when we talk, we say morning and evening, right? But in the Hebrew way of thinking, based on the uh, Genesis text, it's evening and morning. They start their day at sundown the day before based on the Genesis text. So there it is. But with this, we clearly believe in uh, a, a, a God and we are religious. So if someone calls you religious... And says, and says it sort of in a pejorative way. You're just kind of, you're kind of religious. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I follow Christ. I follow the God of the Bible. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, I'm religious. But I think Christians tend to want to go deeper than that. I think evangelicals particularly who believe in, in Christianity, in Christ, don't want to be called religious. I don't think we really like that terminology. And I don't think we want to say, yeah, I'm a follower of a religion. I think most of us are, are raised thinking that Christianity is more of a relationship be, between God and us. And so that we don't like to think of ourselves as being in a religion, but we like to think of ourselves as being in a relationship with the God of the universe. Um, Christians generally prefer to think of that way because when we think of religion, don't we think of, well, this is the way I was trained, that religion is man's way to try to earn his way to God. Religion is sort of, a man-generated or concocted way to please God so that God accepts him and lets him into heaven. And so uh, that's how I was kind of raised thinking of religion and why I don't like to say, yeah, I'm a follower of a religion. Christianity is everything opposed to that, isn't it? Christianity is not, is not what we earn, it's what we receive. It's what Jesus did for us rather than what we do for Jesus. Right, and so it's important for us to understand that. And so someone says, you're a religious man, I can't stand it. Use that as an opportunity to witness, right? I, I think 
One answer to that is just res- respond with an elevator speech, something like this. And you got to prepare for this, guys. An elevator, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I have all kinds of elevator speeches ready to go when someone says certain things, certain stupid things, and <laughs> certain good things, too. So if it says, you're kind of religious, you know, I say, hey, listen, I'm not religious. You smile at them. You know, you say, I'm not religious. I, I am a Christ follower. Listen, if you, if you think I'm religious, the reality is I didn't, there's nothing I could do to, to earn God's favor. I could never be that good. God is way better than I am. So I'm not religious in that sense of earning my way to God. I, I accept Christ because he came and walked this planet and obeyed God's law perfectly for me. And then he took my curse on the cross. Took your curse too, by the way, buddy. So that's who I am. And so be careful. I'm God's property. Leave me alone. <laughs> you know? uh, uh, I, think, I think, guys, sometimes with these questions that we get, that you're so religious, I think we have to learn how, as men, to respond back to comments like that and not let them throw us off and just say, yeah, no, smile, and then come back with something like that. Think about it ahead of time and, and, and come up with it. Now, having said that, that's my first response to How do you follow Jesus in the workplace uh, without being religious? Number one, the answer is simply uh, have a comeback. Accept it. Yeah, I follow religion, but then take it to the next step and and use it as an opportunity to witness. Now, footnote, caveat, there are a lot of other belief systems around us today that cannot be put in the category of of the, one of the four world great religions um, that don't believe in a God, uh, that don't believe in a God that, that governs the universe. Nevertheless, they are very religious in nature. You understand that, don't you? We are around people every day who live with religious fervor, even though they don't believe in a God, and even though they say they don't have faith in anything, they do. And I want you to know about that so that you can push back on them. What are some of those? Humanism is one of them. Humanism is the philosophy that all things can be defined by humanity and by human effort. There is no God. Uh, a, a man is the measure of all things. That's the general study of humanism. And, and there is a belief that we have the answers to everything. So just get the right education. Man can solve all of the problems. Is education solved all of our problems? No, no, it's caused a whole lot. My problem with, with education, so, is they keep dinking with things. They keep changing things. And uh, it's never the same. And they keep making similar mistakes. But humanism, it, do some people live with a fervor that, that humanity has all the answers and that you're an idiot if you look to God? Absolutely. Now, is that, abs- is, is that a faith system? Yeah, because they're stepping out and believing that, that humanity has all the answers. Is there proof that humanity has all the answers? Absolutely not. In fact, there's proof the other way. So with those people who I, I, like, to, I like to smile and I like to say, so what do you have faith in? You have faith in humanity. Let's walk through history together. Let's do a little talk about that. Another one is materialism. Materialism is is lived with religious fervor. It's based on humanism. It's based out of that. There is no God that that, uh, things and what you see is the measure of all things, right? Materialism, that's all there is. Uh, And so what what they basically say is matter always existed. Let me ask you this. Did matter always exist? You guys say no. Well, those that say yes say it always existed. Look, there was a big bang, and, and matter always Is it a faith system to believe that matter always existed? Absolutely, and they believe it with religious fervor. They have faith that matter always existed, even though they weren't there and can't prove it. There's nothing, nothing they can do to prove that matter always existed. And so I always like to say, oh, you were there with the big bang? I said, with the big bang creative. And I said, where did the energy come for the big bang? I, I happen to believe that there might have been a Big Bang, but there had to be a big God that caused the Big Bang. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, an expanding universe, yes. But what I want you to understand is that people around us all over the place live with faith in certain things. Man must worship. We all worship. 
and they have religious faith in something and fervor toward that. Uh, scientism is another one. Faith in anything science, anything science comes up with, they believe, even though the theories of science are almost always wrong. Uh, uh, but the facts of science a lot of times are true. Capitalism is a religion to some. So is communism. So is socialism, which is growing in America today. Political parties on the right and on the left exhibit religious fervor, don't they? One of the other questions I've gotten from you guys is, I'm going to try to address this in the, uh, I think next week, is how do we deal with all the hate that's in the world today, in America particularly, uh, with, with all the different political parties? Why has it gotten to this level? And you will find here the definitive answer to those. I'm going to, I'm going to just give you some initial thoughts on that. But you see, one thing that happens is that when you don't believe that there is a God, when you don't believe that there is a God, what has to replace that? Generally speaking, in history of mankind, when the, and what's happened in America, is with the decline of belief in the Judeo-Christian God, something replaces that, and it's called the state. In Germany, in Nazism, it was the state. Almost always, in totalitarian governments, it's with, uh, the, t- with the leader of that, that totalitarian regime or this ideology, Nazism, communism. It was really just another word for totalitarianism. And uh, so we're see- statism might be another way to put it. What we're seeing today that is causing part of the conflicts is that we have such a decline in a belief of God in America that people are putting their faith in their political parties before God. And that's why there's no forgiveness to one another. Uh, No understanding of one another. But they have a religious faith and fervor in these things. Um, Sometimes if someone calls me religious... Uh, because of this, if they say, you're religious, I'll shoot back and I'll say, yeah, I am. What's yours? What's your religion? What, what do you put your faith in? And then, I, and, then, and then I just feel around the rim of their life a little bit and ask them some questions. And then you find it, and I say, can you prove that? No. Nope. Oh, then you put some faith in that, haven't you? Everybody has a belief system, gentlemen. And everybody is religiously, uh, is, it has some religious fervor about something. So that's one way of looking at this whole thing. Uh, now, the second response to that question uh, is, the, um, is, is, <laughs> is that Christians are trying to be religious. Did you wake up this morning and think, I want to be religious today? Who, anybody? I'm looking around. I know a lot of you. You're not very religious people. That's why I like you. Uh, You know, um, you're going to be able to talk about this around your table in just a minute. It's the second question on your outline today. But the second question is, in your mind, what does it mean to be religious? Because you see, really, that idea, um, that idea is sort of probably generationally developed. Uh, Quite frankly, I don't like many of the connotations of being religious. I, um, I'm drawn to the sacred, but I don't like religion. Um, so I'm going to tell you what I think of as religious, and then answer that, talk about Jesus, and then you can talk about it around your table, okay? Uh, when I think of somebody saying, you're religious, and the person who asked this question is uh, 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 at the Longwood Forge, and he, he, he raised that question because He's working in a real man industry where if you're religious, you're a weenie, right? You get that? And, uh, uh, and so and I, that's why I don't like it, partly, because when I think of somebody who is religious, I think of a guy who's nice, sweet, kind, gentle. I think of Father Mulcahy on MASH, <laughs> you know, a high, squeaky voice. Uh, and um, they like religious environments. They like the religious trappings, uh, whatever it is with their religion. I think of a guy who's religious. I think of a guy who's, frankly, a little soft, um, who's trying to live by a right code of living, and he thinks by being nice and soft, God's going to accept him. And um, religious men, in that way of thinking, stand out to rough-and-tumble guys. If you are softer 
and you're kind of religious and and you know this is kind of a place where like it seems to like uh, attract like I don't think we have many in that category but um, but the reality is you're going to be a target for those guys that work hard, cuss hard, drink hard, live hard, play hard, they're going to see you like a father Mulcahy, and they are going to tease you to no end. This was what was sort of going on with my friend. Not that he's that way, but that he's now in a new job where these guys know he's following Christ, but they give him grief all the time. And that's what we say around here. The male love language is shame and abuse. We kid each other, right, a lot. Well, pagans understand that too. And a pagan is going to go after a religious guy relentlessly. (laughs) Why? Because they don't think it's manly. They don't think it's manly. And so, you know, frankly, I want to be seen as a man and rather a dangerous man at that. I don't want to be known as nice and soft. And All right, so that's my picture of religious. It may not be your picture of religious. You can talk about it around your... T- I also think when I think of religious, I also think of those Buddhist monks that wear those orange flowing robes and sit down with candles and they're trying to solve the world's problem by gaining personal enlightenment and withdrawing from everything. Okay, that's in my mind. That's what I'm thinking of. Um, so my second response to this question, how do you follow Jesus at work without being religious, is to simply say, we aren't trying to be religious. We are Christ followers. We are men following Jesus Christ, and we follow him first and foremost wherever we are, at work, at home, wherever we are. Uh, We're not trying to be religious. Uh, and, and, And guys, what I desperately want from all of us is to get our view of how a man should relate, not from our culture, but from Christ. And so what I really want you to do, I, ch- I challenge you this week, get one of the Gospels. The shortest one is the Gospel of, thank you, read through Mark and look at how Jesus relates to people. Look at how he relates to different type of people. Jesus is God come in the flesh to be our Redeemer, yes, but for men, he is a model of manhood for us. And we need to learn from him. And so here's a couple of things. Jesus' ministry started out with a battle. A couple of things, and you can talk about this around your table. This is going to go real fast because we don't have much time. Uh, Jesus, in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, um, uh, he, he started out. This, is, this battle with the devil in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, is how Jesus starts his ministry. And how many days is he in the wilderness, guys? 40 days. 40 picking days. And he shows us, he models in Matthew 4 how to fight a battle. And that's why I say every day we men should get up and recognize. One of the other questions, one of the other questions I was given is that that we often forget that we're in a battle every day. And like I said, Ephesians 6, uh, 10 through 20 is our family. It's on our family crest. It's our family verse. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. And then he goes into the armor. I, I memorize it That's because I know every day is a fight. Every day, the, the red dot is on the back of my head. You have a target on you because you're a man. Satan went after Adam in the garden. He comes after you every day. If he takes down you, he could take down your family. He takes down a man. He takes down women, children, churches, and culture. And so we need to understand that Jesus, it wasn't gentle Jesus, meek, and mild. It was Jesus every day gearing up for a battle. Every day of Jesus' life was gearing up for a spiritual battle. You can't understand the Gospels unless you understand that as he went out and preached, there were opposition everywhere he went. And there were times he said some really straightforward things to some really bad people. I love it. Um, So there it is. Uh, the, the first thing to understand is that Jesus, Jesus always stood for something. This is, actually, this is the second thing. Jesus' life teaching was straightforward, clear, and challenging. So he started every day with a battle, and so do we. 
and he models that manly approach to life. Secondly, his life teaching was straightforward, clear, and challenging. Matthew 4, 18, let me read a couple of verses. Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and what was his brother's name? Andrew, his brother, casting the net into the sea, for they were fishermen, and he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He didn't say, hey, I have a proposal for you. I got a great idea I want you to think about and pray about. Uh, you know, the, uh, we'll do the pros, do a pro-con sheet on this. Uh-uh. He says, follow me. Uh, I'll make you fishers of men. I will, I will mess up your life so much you will have no idea how I'm going to mess up your life. Jesus calls us to follow him, and then, he, and then he, he changes so many things. It's great. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. You know, there's a very real sense you can't say no to Jesus when he really comes into your life. He comes with such authority. Um, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, and uh, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Okay, so two fishermen, Peter and Andrew, and then James and John. And James and John's nickname was the Sons of Thunder. Yeah, Jesus liked to hang around these meek and mild kind of guys. And he called them, and they left their father and followed him. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people, even when they didn't want him to heal on the Sabbath. Uh, the news spread about him throughout all Syria. They brought to him all who were ill, all who were suffering various diseases, pains, demoniacs, etc., etc., etc. Jesus stood for something everywhere he went. And he models that for us. So when you get criticized, you're so religious. Take that and just say, yeah, I'm a Christ follower. Hey, where are you? Do you believe in God? Enter in. Take it. Stand for something. Wherever we go, Jesus stood for something. That's what it means to be a man following Christ. And it's rough and tumble. And so some of us need to get a little bit more rough and tumble. And we need to remember our identities in Christ. And these guys try to make fun of us. Hey, revel in your identity. Let them make fun of you. People have always made fun of Christians. Uh, I'll never forget when I, uh, after college, before Karen and I got married, I had to wait a year to marry that girl. Uh, so uh, before we went to seminary, I worked for GE delivering refrigerators and, and uh, dishwashers and stuff. And, and I worked with all these longshoremen, all these guys. They were rough and tumbled. And this one, I'll never forget Victor. He hated me. Victor hated everybody. And so when I was put with him to work with him, he was as demeaning and as critical as it could ever be. It's great. I loved it. And, and, and I said, every day when I drive with that guy, it was a challenge. I'm not going to let him get my goat. That's what my New England friends say. That got my goat. Got my goat. I don't get that, but there it is. I wasn't going to let him get my goat. I was going to get him. Guys. Guys, Jesus stood for something wherever he went. He was geared up for battle, and he stood for something. That's what it means to be a man, following Jesus. Jesus teaches us to become like him. Matthew 10, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. If they've called the head of the household Beelzebul, which is demon or Satan, how much more will they malign the members of his household? If they call Jesus the devil, they're going to call you at least religious, Probably some other things. Wear it like a badge. Wear it like a badge. We're to become just like him. Therefore, Jesus, Jesus says, do not fear them. There's nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. Cholerics, you're loving this right now, aren't you? This is Jesus at his choleric best. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. Rather, did you catch that? Don't fear those who can kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, 
but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Gentlemen, we are called to stand for something, to be like Jesus, and this is a manhood that fleshes out. How do you think Christianity is still here today? Because the early church men were willing to die for it. Because the tomb was empty and so was the cross. So if somebody calls you religious, that's a very little thing compared to that. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Some of you, it's easier than others. <laughs> Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Do not fear. You're more valuable than many sparrows. And I love how he wraps it up. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I'll confess before him, before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I'll deny, before, uh, deny him before my Father in heaven. This is my conviction, then you can talk about this around your table, that um, if, if your conviction is when your buddies are saying after work, let's go, get, let's go to the bar, let's get something to, get something to drink, and, and your, your philosophy is I don't drink alcohol, great. But once in a while, go with them. Once in a while, show them that you're a real dude. Uh, drink a Coke. Let them make fun of you. Wear it as a bad of, badge of honor. Uh, if they're drinking three, four, five beers, drink one if you uh, have the liberty in Christ to do that. Uh, don't, don't get drunk, but show them you're a real dude. Hang with them. Now, they're always saying, come with me. You say, no, I got to get home today. I can't do it. I got to go. And I'm not going to the girly bar. You say, you're a weenie. All right, I'm a weenie, but I still have a wife. <laughs> and I want my kids to love me and her to love me more than I want you to love me. Smile when you say that. Be a real dude. Have fun with it. And, and then go home boldly, not worried about what they think of you, but thankful that the Father sees you as a deeply beloved, redeemed son of the Most High God. Um, get rid of the ideas that to be a man means to be soft and gentle. Sometimes it means to be loving and sometimes gentle and sometimes kind. And by the way, your wives really want that, don't they? Yeah, probably the warrior is not the best uh, role to think of for your wife. But warrior up when you walk out there. You got stuff to talk about around your table. Talk about it, and uh, we'll sum it up and get you out of here on time. I don't know about the rest of you guys. This table got way off track. I do you guys off, ever get off track here? No. Well, that's all right. That's all right. Uh, we need brothers uh, that when we get off track, get us back on track. All right. Well, obviously, this conversation, I would love to have been able to be at every one of your tables and hear uh, what you had to say. I mean, that's absolutely uh, uh, what your view of religious is. But we'll talk. We'll talk. Hey, listen. Next week, no forge, right? Every week, every week, we have some, every year, we have somebody show up. We never meet the week of Chris, uh, Thanksgiving, the week of Christmas, or the week after Christmas. Those are our weeks off, okay? So, um, Tuesday, Tuesday night, 7 p.m. at Antioch. That's good, Corey. Corey. Frankly, that shocks me. Uh, that's it, yeah. By the way, Antioch Church, you all know where Antioch Church is down here in Oviedo. Great church. I visited there one Sunday, and they had 30 guys in the choir with football jerseys on. I go, this is my kind of church, you know, and they could sing too. So uh, they got a lot of real men in that church, and uh, it's a great church. The pastor is a wonderful man. And uh, so, all right. Um, a couple of things real quick. Bob Stores and Angel Lozada, would you stand up? Bob, where are you? I know I saw you here. Bob, Angel, stand for a second. Bob, as many of you know, has been at point of helping uh, keep our table leaders uh, growing and, uh, and, and encouraged. And his work schedule has just gotten to the point where he's turning that over to Angel Lozado. Angel's going to be picking that up. And some of that, you're getting your, your emails uh, from 
Angel and maybe Bob too sometimes. I'm kind of still getting them into both. But uh, let's thank Bob and thank Angel for their ministry. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, this is how Forge works. We come in here, uh, we enter the light where there's some heat, we get hammered around the table. Uh, that could be a selling point for some of your rough and tumble friends. Yeah, come to Forge, we get hammered in the morning. And, um, um, <laughs> but uh, invite a friend, invite an enemy, and tell them like the comment that we just made that we're not religious. Sometimes we're a little irreverent, but Jesus loves us and uh, they could become a real man. Uh, promote ForgeBibleStudy.com. When it gets published today, promote it, send it out to somebody. Uh, that would help us get that. And start a fire team like we have in Coco. You or somebody else might want to just use the videos and start their own Bible study on a Saturday morning or a Thursday morning or whatever, and they could do that, use our material to do that. Become a partner. Uh, we're going to be talking about our vision for next year. We're looking for uh, to up our partnership, but that's always something. You can go to forgebiblestudy.com. Uh, we need about 200 partners. Uh, we're on our way to that, uh, but uh, go to forgebiblestudy.com and donate and become a regular partner uh, on that. Jesus will love you more if you do. Um, I'm just kidding, all right? I hang around Steve Brown too much. I got to be careful about that. We have a city to win, and that's no, no joke. We want to win this city. We got a lot to do. All right, so how do we live in such a divisive culture? How can we combat hate? We're going to talk about that next week. Manhood is an important subject, isn't it, guys? Not next week, Steve. The week after next. The week after next. You were listening. I said that on purpose. Uh, manhood is something that you may need to bring to your church. The code of manhood is picked up quickly. One time I met a couple that were in the lobby of our church after. Actually, she, he, he wasn't there, but she was there. I said, how did you get to our church? She said, well, we've been trying churches in the area, and my, I, I liked another church. My husband liked this one, so we're coming here. I said, I'll take it. It's great. Uh, a, tr a man smells manhood. He can also smell the lack of it. And, uh, and, and you may need to be one to help bring that to your church. Father Mulcahy, uh, Mark, my friend Mark back there told me, had a sport in college. It was boxing. So maybe he wasn't as much of a wimp as I thought he was. Jesus was tough and tender, and he knew when to be what? Right? That's one of the things we need to study diligently. I asked my daughter this at the question, uh, at table last night. I said, so you're out in the workplace. Uh, how do you follow Jesus out in the workplace? She said, well, what they tell us is be a marigold and not a walnut tree. I said, What? Apparently, a marigold is a flower that they plant around other plants that it emits something that helps other plants grow. Walnut trees, on the other hand, emit something that poison everything around them. Ah, oh, that's I like that idea. So be a marigold. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> that freaks me out just saying it. I want you to know. <laughs> Kim McCrate gave me this little story I want to end with. A little boy got lost in the YMCA, and he found himself in the woman's locker room. And when he was spotted, the room burst into shrieks and yells. They were running, grabbing towels and running for cover. And the little boy watched all this in amazement. And after a while, he said, what's the matter? Haven't you ever seen a little boy ever? You know. <laughs> And uh, you got to love kids. But because of the immaturity of little kids, they often miss the point. And because of our immaturity, and because we don't follow Jesus, sometimes we miss the point of masculinity. So we got to get it from Jesus. And then we can give it to other people by grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for my friends. Thank you that we're brothers. Thank you that we, uh, we grow together and that you work in our midst. Thank you for Forge and what it means to me. 
And I pray that, Lord, you'd be with my brothers this week as they go out, today as they go out, uh, the rest of this next week with their families. May you use us as your positive light and help us to be tough and tender at the right time and in the right way. And we'll give you praise and honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See you guys soon.